am truly excited to be here, so glad to just be back in the house of God. Has God been good to anybody other than me? Can we just give him a hand, praise, for being good? Come on. He's been amazing, and I'm really excited about this series that we're in. It's called Frequently Asked Questions. And how many of you have questions? Like, there's stuff in the Bible that I have questions about. There are things that don't make a whole lot of sense to me in my little brain that I just have questions. And I distinctly remember a time when I was about 11 years old. I grew up in a small church that was probably about the size of this row right here. Just, that was the whole church. That was all of us. And when you grow up in a small church, you know, you know everybody. And you know every single face. And we had a thing that I'm sure some of you will remember fondly called Sunday school. Anybody forced to go to Sunday school? Notice I said forced. <laughs> Sunday school was not optional in my household. You got up in the morning, church started at 11 a.m., and Sunday school was at 10 a.m. sharp. And in our small church, I was only about the size of this row, we had two classes. One was for adults and one was for the kids. We was all in the same room, so you heard two teachings at the same time. As if my ADHD didn't have enough problems on my own. And I distinctly remember being on the kid's side, and a gentleman walked in on the adult side and sat in the back. And of course, again, small church, you know every face, you know if it's a new person, you know you haven't seen them before. And he caught my, my eye, and maybe 15 minutes into Sunday school, he raises his hand because he has a question for the gentleman that is teaching the adults. And his question still haunts me. He looked at him, he said, you know, I hear you teaching about God and about how good he is and about how great he is and how he loves us. He said, but what if something tragic happened in your life? How would you feel about God then? And he said, let's be more specific. What if something happened to your child? And I remember the gentleman teaching the class, looking at him, and he said, well, I, 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 I don't believe something like that would ever happen to me. You all, my 11-year-old mind knew that was the wrong answer. What do you mean you don't believe something like that would ever happen to you? And the guy that asked the question, he pushed back on that. He asked again, but what if something tragic happened to your daughter? What if something terrible happened? How would you deal with that? How would you navigate your relationship with God in that instance? And the answer again came back very callous, very non-empathetic of, well, my faith is that God wouldn't allow something like that to happen and my prayers are for protection and I believe God would answer that and he just wouldn't allow something like that to happen in my life. I, I can't talk about your faith, I'm just talking about mine. And I watched this man's face crumble. He picked up his stuff and he walked out of our building. And since the age of 11, I spend time wondering whatever happened to that gentleman. Where did he go? When he left us, did he see someone else? Did he talk to anyone else? What happened to his life? Because obviously there was something that went terribly wrong in his life. Here's another question I had. Why did no one in my church follow him out the door? When he asked this question, and you could tell there was something more than a question here, why was it that no one on that side of the building came and gathered around this man? Said, let us pray for you. Why was it that the answer he got never invited real discussion on his question? Because sometimes real people walk into your life with real questions. In church, we have a responsibility to give them real answers. We missed an opportunity that day. And when I tell you that it haunts me, I mean that in such a way that it has been a challenge and a burden for me to do all that I can to learn as much about this Bible so that if I'm ever greeted by that man again in my life, I will be able to answer his question. And when PK said, we are doing a series on frequently asked questions about the Bible. My heart did a flip. Yes, because I've got questions. I've been loving on Jesus a long time. Some years better than others. <laughs> and regardless of how much I learn, I still have questions. And when I come across people that I'm trying to convince that Jesus is what they need in their life, 
they have questions. And the Bible tells us in 1 Peter chapter 3, if someone asks about your Christian hope, always be ready to explain it, but do this in a gentle and respectful way. Because it's an opportunity where even if you don't know the answer, simply saying, I don't know, in love can do wonders. Let's search that out together. Let's jump in the Bible. Hey, let's get together. Matter of fact, I'm going to go call a couple of people and let's work on see if we can find that out. I believe the people God wants us to reach are outside of this building. And we need to be able to walk out of here with information that's going to be of help. There's a lot of gray areas in the Bible, you all. There's a lot of things that I don't fully understand. However, when the Bible says that we should study to show ourselves approved, I believe that we should do that because there is a lot of Bible that goes into great detail on specific topics. And one of the ones that I'm here to talk about with you today is one of the most important questions you will ever answer to somebody. And that is simply, why do Christians believe that Jesus is the only way to God? Because that's what we tell people. Matter of fact, not just what we told people. Biblically, Jesus said this in John 14 and 6. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus did not leave a lot of wiggle room. He did not say, I'm one of a few ways to get to God. He didn't say, you know, on Tuesday and Thursday, I'm a good way to go see He did not say, I could be a possibility if you just give me an opportunity. He said, I am the only way. This is repeated by Peter in Acts chapter 4, where Peter says, For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. He said, there is no other name. Again, not a lot of wiggle room there. Like, well, well, could it possibly be? Mm -mm -mm. He says there is none other. And when people ask us, well, why do you believe that? As Christians, I laugh a little bit because we start hemming and hawing when we get asked why we believe stuff. Uh, 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 That's what the Bible said. (laughs) Okay. Uh, Well, uh, it's what Jesus said in, in the Bible. Okay. Well, you, you, you just got to have faith. You just got to have faith. You just got to believe it by faith, and, 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 that, and that's got to be enough. Brother, if I'm outside of this church and I'm talking to folks that don't know Jesus, have no faith in what I'm talking about, and do not read this Bible, those answers are not going to fly. How about I ask somebody to have faith when they don't know Christ? And we understand that the biblical definition of faith, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So if we're talking about substance, that person is asking you when they say, why do you believe this? Can you give me some substance of why you hope that to be true? Can you give me some evidence of why you believe this thing that you've never seen is real? And we should have an answer on why we believe this to be true. Because now all of a sudden when you don't, how are we any different than anyone else that just says my truth is truth and your truth is truth and it doesn't really matter whose truth is what. You believe what you want. When we believe that that truth is what will save people's lives. On this topic specifically, I think the Bible gives us some real details. It walks us through the exact answer of why Jesus is so important. And I want to jump into the passage, and then we're going to pray. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20, it tells us, For just as all people die because of their union with Adam, in the same way all will be raised to life because of their union with Christ. But each one will be raised in proper order. Christ, first of all, and then at the time of his coming, those who belong to him. Then the end will come. Christ will overcome all spiritual rulers, authorities, and powers, and will hand over the kingdom to God the Father. For Christ must rule until God defeats all enemies and puts them under his feet. The last enemy to be defeated will be death, for the scriptures say... God put all things under his feet. It's clear, of course, that the words all things do not include God himself, who put all things under Christ... 
But when all things have been placed under Christ's rule, then he himself, the Son, will place himself under God, who placed all things under him, and God will rule completely over all. Let's pray, church. Dear Lord, I thank you for this day and this time. I thank you for the reading of your word. God, I pray that you will help me to effectively explain your word and your plan from the beginning of this Bible through the end. It is all connected. God, I pray that people leave here with an understanding of who you are and what you're looking to do so that we can explain this to those that need Jesus in their lives. Bless this word. Bless this time in Jesus' name. Let everyone say amen. 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 So let me help you understand how we got to this place. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and he does something strange to me that explains how this mess got started, this mess being us and what's happening in this world right now. God makes everything and says it is good. He makes Adam and Eve, and he says, ooh, these are very good. And then he leaves us in charge. Why, Jesus? Why you leave us in charge? We don't know what we're doing. We didn't make this. We don't, you ever give something to folks that don't really appreciate what they got? This is why they tell you as a parent, don't buy your kids a nice, beautiful new car for their first vehicle because they won't appreciate it. No, you buy them a little raggedy car to barely start. They got to kick it two times and then honk the horn before it turn on. That's the car you get your, your kid for their first vehicle. All the teenagers in here, I'm sorry. I'm messing up your dream. I know. (laughs) But God builds this beautiful world and then gives it to us. Here's what he says, because I don't want you thinking this is just Pastor Jay making up stuff. It says in Genesis 1, 27, 28, God created human beings, making them to be like himself. He created them male and female, blessed them and said, have many children so that your descendants will live all over the earth and bring it under their control. Then he says this phrase, I am putting you in charge of the fish, the birds, and all the wild animals. Psalm 115 and 16. David writes, heaven belongs to the Lord of long, but he gave the earth to us humans. For those that believe in the power of prayer, this is why prayer is so important. Because we have been given dominion and authority here on earth. And our prayers release God to act his will on this earth because we are the ones holding him hostage. People want to say that God can do anything but fail. I've heard that from a lot of my super Christians. And you know what? God can do anything except go back on his word. God is restrained by his own word. So when through his word he gave dominion and authority to man, he now needs us to pray according to his will so that he can do that. This is why Jesus said, when you pray, you should pray our Father, which art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Because God's will is already being enacted in heaven. It's down here where we got problems. Because down here we run stuff. Down here we're in charge. And God is sitting somewhere face palm and saying, I need some people to pray and let me get back involved. Because you messing up everything that I made, everything I built. This is not how I wanted it to look. This is not how I wanted it to be. You are tearing up my house. You are messing up my testimony. We're doing a wonderful job, y'all. So this is how God looks at us. And in Hebrews chapter 2, these are just some additional scriptures. It says, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? A son of man that you care for him. You made them a little lower than the angels. You crowned them with glory and honor and put everything under their feet. God put us in charge. And you know what we did? Like children that don't know what they got, we gave it away. We gave it away. We gave the authority that God gave us away. Check this out. 
In Romans 5, 12, and 19, it says, when Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. Because one person disobeyed God, many became sinners. We gave it away to sin and to death. This is how death enters the world. Now look, y'all. At some point in time, I believe Jesus is going to come get me or he's going to come back here. The Bible leads me to believe there's not going to be any fighting in heaven. However, when I get there, I'm going to try to put that to the test because I got a problem with Adam. And when I see him, we got a problem on sight. I need to see you in this corner real quick. <laughs> Jesus, I just need two minutes. That's all I'm saying. Just, <laughs> we got eternity for me to get this back right. I need two minutes with Adam. You notice in the Bible, nothing happens when Eve bites the fruit. I know people want to blame Eve and say it's her fault. No, nothing happened. I don't even, I'm not convinced God even told Eve not to eat the thing. She eats the apple, nothing happens. She bring it to Adam. The minute he take a bite, all hell break loose everywhere. <laughs> Which to me is an eye-opening thing. Men, number one, quit blaming your wife for all this stuff that's going on in your household. <laughs> huh, let all the wives say Amen. Number two, your house ain't really jacked up until you as a man walk away from your responsibilities. What has God asked you to do? Well, this woman you gave me, uh uh-uh. What did God say to you? I believe we could have had a whole different outcome had Adam just not taken a bite and went and told Jesus, like, look, God, hey, she ate it. I'm sorry I wasn't with her 24-7, Lord. I wanted some, some space in the man cave over here. (laughs) <laughs> I just think things could have been a little different. So since he didn't, I got a problem with Adam. When y'all, we all get to heaven, just pull me off of him if you see me, okay? That's all I'm saying. <laughs> but we see also, not only do we give our authority away to sin and to death, we gave our authority away to Satan. Here's why I believe that. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 8, it tells us the devil subjected Jesus to a third test. He took Jesus to the top of a very high mountain, and this is during the temptation of Jesus when the Holy Spirit has driven him into the wilderness to be tempted. It says he showed Jesus all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor and glory, their power and pomp. And the devil said, if you bow down and worship me, I will give you all these kingdoms. Jesus has an interesting answer here. He says, get away from me. I will not serve you. I will instead follow scripture, which tells us to worship the eternal one, your God, and serve only him. In my opinion, this would have been a great opportunity for Jesus to look Satan right in the eye and be like, you are a liar. But he doesn't say that. Satan says, you see all of this? It's all mine. And Jesus never denies that reality. He never says, no, that's not yours. You don't own that. You're not in control of this. This is not something that you can give me. He never once tells him that. His response is, I will not serve you. Did you know that Satan can offer you some stuff if you just serve him? Did you know that you can make a trade with the devil? He's happy to make it. Oh, I'm in control of some stuff. Did you know that Jesus refers to Satan multiple times in the New Testament as the prince of this world? Did you know that in the book of Revelation, there is a letter written to a church? This is in Revelation chapter 2, and the church is in Pergamum, Turkey. And the writer says, I know where you live, and in that place is where Satan has set up his throne. Because the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of heaven exists. And Satan's got his kingdom too. And the Bible talks about there being a throne of his here. And this is why we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against principalities, rulers, spiritual witnesses in high places that has dominion and set up their kingdom here to try to disrupt the one that God wants to bring. And when Jesus doesn't deny this claim, It helps me to understand the reality. Number one, Jesus did come to get these things. He came to get these kingdoms. He came to take all of this stuff back. So Satan says, I can give it to you easier than God will. 
Oh, God wants you to suffer for this. He wants you to have, that's his plan for you to go through all of this. Jesus, do you really want a cross? You don't have to have a cross to get this. I can give this to you right now. What I have found out over the course of my life is that Satan runs a lot faster than God does. <laughs> oh, when I pray and ask for stuff and I have dreams and things that I would want to have in my life, I want to achieve, Satan be on the job. He be showing up with like, here you go. All you got to do is compromise this just a little bit. All you got to do is tell this lie over here and look at what you get. All you have to do is just, I know that's what you believe. I know you're a pastor, but hey, you know what? All pastors mess up every now and then. Nobody has to know, and look at what I can give you. Because Satan's gifts always come wrapped in things you don't want. In a result that you don't really want to have. You'll get what you want, but not in the way you want it. And I promise you, it will not bring you the happiness that you desire. This is why Jesus said, if you're unwilling to pick up your cross, you can have no part of me. There's always a cross to carry. If you want God's will in your life to be complete and brought to fruition, you must be willing to carry your cross. And Satan's going to do everything possible to keep you from having to do that. So here on this scene, Jesus is being confronted with exactly what he has been sent to get. But the reality is that God has had a plan since the beginning. We know that he gave us authority. We know that we gave the authority away. And it reminds me of a TV show I used to grow up watching. Back in the 90s, early, I should say late 80s, there was a show called The Cosby Show. And there was a young lady on that show named Claire Huxtable. Now, Claire Huxtable, Ran a tight ship in her house. <laughs> Spent a lot of time trying to keep her husband from jacking stuff up. <laughs> and in this episode, she gets sick with the flu. And she ends up laying in the bed, can barely move, can't talk, just hurting. And anybody in this room knows that when mama gets sick, stuff, we have a problem. <laughs> so she does what wives all over the world hate to do. She left her husband in charge. <laughs> she tells her husband, you got to take care of everything. I'm too sick. And fellas, you know, when they leave us in charge, the rules change, okay? Because <laughs> when you leave daddy in charge of the kids, healthy food options go out the window. I ain't trying to cook all of that. What you talking about? We go about, you want a pizza? You want a pizza? <laughs> one for you, one for me? <laughs> Oh, we let the kids do all type of stuff that they wouldn't normally do if mama was sitting there. You, oh, you, you want to backflip off the couch? Let me go get a couple of pillows. No problem. <laughs> we help the kids do all type of stuff. We dig holes in the back. We let them drive the car down the street for two or three minutes and let nobody make sure anybody looking. We do all type of stuff because that's what daddies do. The rules change. Well, the problem was here for Miss Claire Huxtable was that about a day or so into this, Cliff Huxtable gets sick, and now he got the flu too. And she's like, you can't be sick. Who's taking care of the house? And he says, don't worry, I left Theo in charge. <laughs> well, Theo is their 15-year-old son. And typically the last thing you want to do is leave your 15-year-old son in charge of the whole household when you can't have nothing to do with it. Theo is in charge and he takes full advantage. He is driving his sisters nuts. He is domineering and dominating everything. He's handing out laws and rules. Here's your job. Here's your job. Here's what you're going to do. Here's what you need to have done. Here's your timeline on it. And they look at him and say, uh, but what are you going to do? He said, I'm supervising. <laughs> Basically, nothing. <laughs> I'm going to do what I want to do. He on the phone. He watching TV. He doing all type of stuff. And the sisters get sick of him, and they say, we're overthrowing Theo. It's a mutiny in the house. We're not doing nothing else you say. We quit. Nothing's happening. And Claire Huxtable all the way upstairs hears the screaming and the yelling and the arguing and the foolishness that's going on on a floor underneath her. She throws the covers off, and she says, I am declaring myself well. I am no longer sick. 
And Cliff looks at her and says, what you mean you're no longer sick? You in the bed with me. You, you got the flu. She said, no, I can't have the flu because these folks is about to tear up my house. I think that's how God felt about us. I think God was on the upstairs floor and he's looking down at us. He's like, these, these folks is tearing my stuff up. That's it. I'm declaring myself back in charge. But here's the thing. God is bound by his word. So he knew he gave authority to man. He knew that we gave that authority away. So the only way for him to get that authority back, he had to send a man to grab the authority from sin, death, hell, the grave, Satan, snatch those keys back, and as a man, hand it back to God. Because God is bound by his own word and the system that he has placed in order. So a man must reclaim the authority and give it back. And in Romans 5, 19, we see that because one other person obeyed God, many will be made righteous. We see in 1 Peter 3, 18, the anointed one suffered for sins once for all time, the righteous suffering for the unrighteous, check this out, so that he might bring us to God. Who is he? Who is, who is, who is this person that is charged with bringing us back to God? Well, I'm here to tell you that is none other than Jesus Christ. This is why his birth was so important. God overshadows a virgin. She conceives and bears a son that is all God, according to the Bible, the literal physical manifestation of God himself and all man. And this man is given the goal of bringing everything back to where God originally had it. Now, I need to explain to you how this process works because this is getting into our answer of why do we believe Jesus is the only one. There is coming a time that we see quickly running at us. If you haven't noticed, the weather has been crazy. Look worldwide. Look at all the things that are going on. The Bible refers to these things as growing pains, as birth pains, as the world can't wait for the return of Christ where the sons of God will be revealed. We're seeing wars and rumors of wars. We're seeing a world where the love of many has waxed cold. I'm giving you Bible. These are things that Jesus said would happen before the end comes. There's a time that's called in the Bible the Great Tribulation. And if you're not aware of this or not totally in knowledge of it, in the end times, according to Revelation, there will come a gentleman on the scene, and we will know him as the Antichrist, who is going to broker peace in a way that's never been done before. And for those that are still here, we believe that the rapture happens before all of this craziness breaks loose. I pray to God the rapture happens before all this craziness breaks loose. But according to the Bible, this Antichrist is going to begin persecuting Christians in a way that has never been seen. And y'all know the world has seen persecution of Christians. And the great tribulation is a time where God pours out his wrath on the world for what they have done and are currently doing to his children. And in Revelation, it talks about how there are seven trumpets. These are judgments. There are seven bowls. These are judgments. There are seven seals. These are judgments being poured out on the world. They are supernatural in nature. Crazy things are happening. And some of these parts of the water supply turns to blood. In some of these, a piece of the sun is darkened. In some of these, there are sores. In some of these, there are a demonic army that marches across the earth, killing and ransacking places and people. Unbelievable things that the Bible said is coming during this tribulation period. The Bible tells us that unless the days were shortened, everyone would die. But somewhere during this time, Jesus receives the call from God the Father that it's time to return. And when Jesus returns this time, it's not going to be like the first time he came. See, when he came the first time, he came meek and mild. He came born in a manger. He came as a baby. He came as a sacrificial lamb of God. But this 
time when he comes. The Bible says there will be a sound of a trumpet. There will be a shout. Jesus is going to come on the scene, not as a sacrificial lamb, but he's showing up as the lion of Judah. He's coming back as a conquering king. He's coming back to take everything that has ever been his. He's coming to reclaim this entire world. Jesus shows up as the Jewish nation thought he would the first time. He returns. This is not for play play. This is not a game anymore. You are either with me or against me. According to the Bible, all those who have taken the mark of the beast on their wrist or on their forehead at this point in time, Jesus is in destruction mode. Now, let me help you all real quick because I got some folks that's real saved in here. The mark of the beast is not here yet, y'all, okay? I got some folks that be sending me emails and stuff about, uh, you know, this tap the pay system and, you know, they got Google Pay on your phone. Google Pay is not the mark of the beast. Okay? Tap the pay at Target is okay. They at <laughs> y'all quit coming to Target pouring all your loose change out on the counter in front of me. Use a credit card <laughs> and get out the way. <laughs> Got places to go, playing around with you, because you worried about the market of bees at Target. <laughs> All the folks that shop at Target, y'all know what I'm talking about. Them folks be sitting there, I think I got 17 more sit. Hold on a minute. No. Take this dollar. Matter of fact, move out the way. Let me swipe my card. I'll tap and pay it. <laughs> but the Bible tells us that The mark of the beast will prohibit you from buying, from selling, from eating, from doing anything, and it will be a very clear-cut decision that if you don't take this mark, you are going to suffer death. We're not there yet. But that time is coming, and you can see the technology being put into place to allow that to happen. So when Jesus returns as a conquering king, and he destroys all of those that have taken this mark, He sets up what's called a 1,000-year kingdom. We know this as the millennial kingdom. And in this kingdom, here on earth, Jesus rules. Ain't that crazy? Jesus rules on earth. Who's alive during that time? I'm going to answer a few more of the questions you may have or someone else may ask you. Who's alive are those that have somehow lived through the great tribulation and never took the mark of the beast? They may not even be Christians. They just refuse to take the mark. Maybe they were a serious prepper and they lived underground the whole time. I don't know. There are going to be those who are believers that refuse to take the mark and somehow manage to survive throughout that. They will still be present on earth. And then the Bible says that we will see the first resurrection, which is all of the believers who were beheaded, who were killed, who suffered during the great tribulation, they will be raised back to life to reign with Jesus for 1,000 years. That's crazy. It says that Satan's going to be grabbed and thrown into a pit where he cannot deceive anyone for that time. But you know what the problem still is? This stuff called flesh will still exist. And even in a kingdom that Jesus himself runs, people will still make decisions that go against God's will. At the end of this thousand years, the Bible says that the pit will be opened and Satan will be released for a time. And even under the reign of Christ, the Bible tells us that Satan masses an army of people that's like the grains of sand. To go against the kingdom of God, to attack Jesus as the ruler of this world. And you think about how crazy that is. And it says there's this army of masses and heads towards whatever the city is, wherever this is where Jesus sets up his reign that God himself pours out fire down from heaven to consume all of those that align themselves against Christ. And at this point in time, all of Jesus' enemies have been placed under his feet. 
everyone and everything is now under the rule of Jesus Christ. This is when the Bible tells us at this time that death, hell, Satan, and all those that would align themselves with him are thrown into the lake of fire. This is where death is finally overcome. And Jesus, at this point in time, does what this scripture says. And again, this is in Corinthians 15. So that the son who has authority over all things turns and gives it back to God. So that God can reign supreme. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. I am not here to debate the validity of any other religion. You can believe whatever you want to believe. I'm not here to fight with you over Buddhism or Hinduism or Jehovah's Witness or any of a number of other religions that exist in our world. I'm not here to argue with you. I'm not here to tell you that there aren't other deities and that there aren't other things that you can worship. I'm not here to argue with you over that. What I'm here to tell you is that at the end of time, Jay English believes, according to this Bible, that when the royal rumble ends, Jesus Christ will be standing supreme as the only winner. He's going to have the championship belt on his shoulder. He will be making the calls. He is the one that walks out of the fire unscathed. And it says at that point, I'm here to tell you that if your name has not been engraved in his hand, I'm here to tell you that if your name has not been written in the Lamb's book of life, when he turns around to bring all of those that are aligned with him, all of those that have suffered for him, all of those that have died proclaiming his name, all the people who saw themselves set on fire but said, I will not forsake Jesus for my own life, all of us in this room that know that Jesus is our Savior, he will gather us all together and hand us back to God. This is why Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And nobody, I don't care who you are. I don't care what you've done. I don't care how much money you got in the bank. I don't care how many good things you've done. I don't care how many people you've seen saved. You can preach this gospel and everyone around you can go to heaven and you can miss it yourself. He says, all of those that believe in me. It's not about works, lest any man should boast. It's about belief. It's about putting your trust in Jesus that at the end of time, he's going to reign over everything and give it back to God. He says, I am the one-way ticket. I am the only bus out of this situation. It's not that you can't believe there are other ways. What I'm telling you is, if Jesus actually stands by himself at the end, that would make him the only way. And when I explain this to people that don't know Christ and don't know Bible and have never heard it explained that way and the light bulbs start clicking like, that actually makes some sense. It leads to further conversations about who Jesus is, about how much God loved us to put this plan in place from Genesis through Revelation. All he wants is you. Every decision he's made is because he loves you. He wants at the end of time when God has the great white throne judgment, which is where he makes his final decisions. All God wants to do is look at those that have put their trust in Jesus and say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into my rest. Y'all, I'm living my life today to hear that said by God. That's all I want to hear him say when he asks me, for the many sins you've committed. And I know when he run the list, it's going to be many, 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 many sins you've committed, partner. And I look up there and be like, yep, I did all of Ooh, I did all of that. Mm. <laughs> mm, Jesus, I forgot I did that one. <laughs> and he says, yeah, so who's paying for that? And I say, not me. Because Jesus already did. He already paid it. The price has already been paid. 
I've got an all expenses paid trip to eternity waiting on me. And all I got to do is show up. But if you reject Jesus, you're denying the gift that's already been paid for. So in this room, as I'm talking to you, where I hopefully have addressed both your logic and your heart, if you are in this room and you know that you haven't in the past given Jesus all of you, if you haven't yet given him an opportunity to rule your life here and now, maybe you have and at some point you walked away, you stepped back from the calling God had for you, you stepped away from the love that he wants to bestow upon you, maybe you have backslid, backstepped, moonwalked, whatever you want to call it, away from what God wanted you to do. If you are in this room under the sound of my voice, I'm going to count to three and I want you to just stand up where you are and say, I want Jesus to have total control of me today. One, get ready. Two, put your hands on your seat. Satan is going to try to convince you not to stand up. Tell him he's a liar and you're not listening to him. Your faith is being put into action by your works right now. Three, stand up on your feet wherever you are. It's time to give it back to God. Come on. Come on, church. Come on, church. Let's give it back. Let's give it back to God. Let's give it back to God. It's time. It's time. It is time, church. Amen. It's time to walk in the fullness of your calling. It's time to be who he's called you to be. The time for playing around is over. Recognize that we have a world outside of here that is dying and on its way to hell, and we have the best answer to solve that problem, but we got to take the medicine ourselves first. Amen. For so many of you that are standing here, we're going to all pray together. If you're already saved, you're going to say this, and it's just a rededication. If it's your very first time, I'm getting ready to welcome you into the family that you've been wanting to be a part of. Trust me. Can we all pray together? Let's bow our heads. Just repeat after me. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And I know that I deserve death. But you came on the scene. And you died for me. And you paid my price. You shed your blood and spent three days in a tomb. But you didn't stay there. You are alive and well and offering me your gift of salvation. So I give you my heart. I give you my mind. I give you my soul. And I receive your gift. Make me into what you would have me to be in Jesus name come on amen come on let's give God some praise in here yes yes we serve an amazing God I want to invite everybody to stand up on your feet where you are we've had a good day today I pray that you leave here with an understanding of why we preach Jesus the way we do here. When we talk about making it easy to find and experience God, that's the goal because we need you to accept Christ. We need you. I'm trying to have this party on the other side. And I'd have met some of y'all in the lobby. It's going to be a party. <laughs> some of y'all going to get us in trouble. We're going to see if we can get kicked out. <laughs> but I'm excited about what God is doing. And I want to encourage you, be open to answering questions. Your life should be lived in such a way that it makes people ask you questions. Be ready to answer, to always be willing to give an account on why you believe what you believe. But most importantly, here's why we believe Jesus reigns supreme and why we should give our lives to him.